Jesse, what's up? Hey, Katie. How are you doing? Oh, just fine. And you? I'm good. This is so blunt. <laughs> Mrs. Hertz. Oh, oh, yeah, Mrs. You are a Mrs. <laughs> I am a Mrs. That is weird. It still pisses me off so much that you were allowed to do that. Well, Jesse, you too could be a Mrs. You could be a Mrs. Single someday. We don't talk enough about my far right uh, social conservatism, but gay marriage, not for me. Um, I have been, I've been sort of returning back to the world and I went to an interesting event the other night. An event? You went to an event? I went to an event. Can I guess what it was? Yep. Exorcism. Uh yes. <laughs> yeah, I was I was I, got it. Knew I it. was uh they exercised me so I'm a I'm a Christian now. <laughs> I so if you're if there are a lot of journalism is mostly downsides but you do event sometimes get invited to events with like free food and drink. That is the only real criteria I use to determine whether to go to something. This was like this organization they're officially launching next year they're all about dialogue and bipartisanship stuff like that blah, I, was like, blah, if- blah. <laughs> I was like i read that and then i saw there'd be free mexican food i was like this sounds like my kind of organization so i go it's maybe 40 or 50 people about half journalists half entrepreneurs like capital e entrepreneurs at one point we we're in a circle we quickly just say a few things about ourselves because it's like effectively a networking event and i noticed this incredible difference in how journalists and entrepreneurs like communicate so i was one of the first uh people to introduce myself during the circle and i'm like oh, yeah i'm uh jesse single i i co-host a podcast and I, I fucking hate myself that was like basically what it sounded like every journalist is like staring at their feet they're sad, they're anxious, they don't want to self-promote. They can barely communicate without like breaking into tears. Every entrepreneur is like, hello, I'm Joe Smith, and I have a startup that gives Wi-Fi to sea turtles. (laughs) It's worth $8 trillion. I just, I honestly think they're our natural enemies and that we should fight them. Are they connecting? Is it like a brother sister program? Like a, like an entrepreneur <laughs> takes a, a, a poor journalist under, under his or her wing? Yeah, they adopt low income podcasters <laughs> and then bring them to the, uh, to MoMA. That sounds like a worthy cause. It does. I ended up, um, I don't think I'm revealing anything to whatever. I ended up hanging out with Coleman Hughes. Um, oh, nice. Most of the that? night. It was good. I mean, so I was, some of the entrepreneurs, I was rolling my eyes a little, even though they were nice. So I, then I went out to hang out with Coleman Hughes, but then that got annoying because he's fucking 25 and he's like better at everything than me, arguably even yeah. blacker than me, I would say. Not that I see race. Uh, maybe maybe slightly blacker. Slightly, slightly blacker. blacker. Did you guys rap together since you're both SoundCloud rappers? Did I rap with my close black friend Coleman Hughes? Of, co- of <laughs> course I did. You know, I realized after I said that that it sounded racist, but Coleman actually is a ra- rapper, a rapist, as are you. So it's this is a natural a natural allegiance here. This is not because that the, because he's black. This is because he's an actual rapper. Uh, <laughs> I should have asked him to rap as soon as I saw him. Uh, no, it was it was actually it was a fun night i met this other journalist who does immigration stuff that sounds cool and the entrepreneurs were cool they're just so like confident in their vision and i i am never that confident about anything so that was my story well hopefully in the uh the mentoring section of the program you'll uh learn a little (laughs) self-esteem i just i just get to the museum and it's just like jesse why is your shirt covered in ketchup come on He's trying to teach me life skills. You should start introducing yourself as Jesse Single, blue check mark, hundred thousand followers. <laughs> Congratulations on that, by the way. I saw you crossed over to a hundred thousand. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I didn't want to uh, make a big thing of it, but I'm. Um, well, I'm glad you didn't because it would have been, it would have been embarrassing. What percentage of my hundred thousand followers do you think like ninety nine actively dislike me? Ninety nine. You think it's ninety nine? Like it wouldn't shock me if it was forty percent followed me just for like the train wreck aspect of it. I don't know. I bet it's. I bet it's like like a quarter. A quarter hate me. Those are only the ones that know you. If if more people actually knew you, it would be higher. Yeah. Well. Anyway, what is the name of this very non confident podcast? This is Blocked and Reported, and I am Katie Herzog. I am Jesse Single. Uh, call me Doctor. Once you get a hundred thousand Twitter followers, you have the title of a uh, Doctor. So I'm Doctor Jesse Single. An honorary EDD. Exactly. Um, Katie, what are some of the things we're going to discuss today? I actually don't know. Uh, we are going to discuss. <laughs> we have. Well, come on, this was not like a high effort week for us. We should be honest about that going in. No, that's not true. I did it. I did an entirely full interview by myself without you. 
Um, later in the podcast, we're going to air that. It is a conversation between me and Megan Murphy um, of various – Wait, doesn't she hate trans people? Yeah. She's the one who hates trans people and men. She also hates men. She's a heterosexual woman who hates men. We're also going to um, uh, follow up on a couple of stories we talked about last week. Also, what if – your boyfriend or girlfriend was a sword? An excellent question. We will get to that in a moment. But first, we have a little bit of uh, housekeeping to wrap up from last week, right? Yeah. One thing from last week we talked about, uh, you can go back and listen. We talked about Alice Ripley, who is a Broadway star accused of grooming. Imagine just the largest air quotes in the universe. One of her accusers was a young woman named Brie Lynn, I believe her name is. Uh, we had talked about how she had sort of just casually mentioned that one of Ripley's fans tried to murder her. So the Daily Beast reported on this, but didn't just like like put in this throwaway line, this allegation that this woman had been the subject of an attempted murder and didn't do any sort of due diligence or digging or even tell the story. Yeah, it just didn't get – it was it was very weird. But um, Lynn herself did a TikTok explaining what happened. Maybe we'll just drop that here. The incident was pretty heavily revolving around fan drama. Um, the adult that I was traveling with who is also a fan that my family trusted very, very much. Um, I had spent a lot of time with her up to this point. She had been in my house for holidays. I had stayed at her house in New York. Had never had a problem with her up until this point. The day before this incident, I received a text from Alice telling me that I needed to be careful around this fan, which I found a little bit odd because I had been traveling with her since the beginning of the tour and had spent a ton of time with her prior to the tour. So this fan that I was traveling with got pissed off about a situation that was between me and another fan. Um, she grabbed my phone out of my hand, would not give it back to me. Um, shoved me as hard as she could into a 10th story window. Um, I got away from her. I started to run for the door. She shoved me into the door, closed it, locked it. Um, I was trying to think smart and I had my laptop with me. So I grabbed my laptop and ran into the bathroom and locked myself in the bathroom because I had no idea what this woman was going to do to me, but I knew that she was very violent and she was willing to hurt me at that point. This was during the next normal tour stop in Chicago, and as soon as I was able to get in touch with my family, my mom and dad flew out to Chicago. I was 14 at this point, and in the meantime, I was terrified. It takes a minute for my parents to get to the airport, go through security, get on a plane, the plane ride to Chicago, get off the plane, and actually get to me. Um, and I reached out to Alice, who was very nonchalant about the situation, and just didn't want to communicate with me at all. I actually ended up reaching out to a different cast member who knew me um, not as well, but we had communicated before. And that cast member actually talked to me uh, the entire time for several hours um, to make sure that I was communicating with somebody until my parents arrived. Um, Alice was absolutely no help to me, despite me her knowing me the best, despite her being the only person in the state who knew me very, very well. Um, and she just didn't care. Now, I don't necessarily think that it was Alice's responsibility to do anything. Um, but I know now as an adult that if a teenager is reaching out to you because they're in danger, um, you certainly don't do nothing. The reason I put that in the video is because it's insult to injury. And I just want people to be aware that Alice, as somebody who acted like she cared very greatly about her fans, mental health, safety and well-being, she really didn't. And following that situation, she also gaslit me and blamed me for getting involved in fan drama. So, Katie, what, what did you think of this? First thought, why didn't she call the cops or <laughs> someone else? Like, why is this girl going to cast members of a Broadway show when she's having these, like, real personal crises? It seems very weird. I can honestly see why Alice Ripley wouldn't want to get fucking involved. I feel sort of bad for the cast member who got roped into dealing with the situation. But also, like, if you're locked in a bathroom and you're afraid that somebody – you're genuinely afraid that somebody's going to hurt you, call the fucking cops. Yeah. So, so yes. Why don't you call the cops? There's also this whole thing, this whole thing where – you let your daughter travel with an adult to follow a Broadway show around? I don't know. That seems weird to me. It's very, like, almost famous. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Do you know that movie about the groupies? It's like that, but like a, a like more wholesome, like, theater girl, drama kid, drama kid style. Yeah. I guess so. And this ties into 
an email we got that we can't read or say much about, but it was from someone in the it was from someone in Ripley's world, and this person's argument was like fans um become convinced they are much closer to these figures than they really are. And I think that sort of jibed with this idea that someone someone's trying to murder me, I'll call Alice Ripley or I'll text Alice Ripley. It just doesn't really make sense. Yeah, someone on our subreddit had, I think, a pretty astute observation about this. And this person said that, I think it was a, a female, said that when she was younger, was a teenager, she had these, like in high school, she had these relationships with teachers that she thought were very meaningful. And she would like, she would feel slighted by a teacher or perseverate. It was a crush. It was essentially a crush. And she sort of built into her head, uh, you know, not that different from a fandom that there was this existing relationship when really there wasn't. And and I can sort of like looking back on my own teenage years, I sort of had relationships like that with like pro kayakers, pro women kayakers <laughs> who I was super fans of, but I was also sort of in their orbit because I was also a competitor. And I yeah. did have these very intense, like what it were essentially crushes on these women thinking that these were real relationships when basically I was just like a younger, like a fan who was also sort of tangentially related to this community um and i'm it's, like very embarrassing to think about now i remember when i was like maybe eight i went to a, a day camp one summer and there was a counselor i was just i was obsessed with him it wasn't like obviously i'm eight are you coming uh, out right now i was gonna say i'm eight and ostensibly straight but no i i just like thought he was the coolest guy ever and i wanted to be him and i think when you're younger that's a thing and then you add in the drama element and People are going to get mad at me for saying this again, but you add in the spectrum element, which I do think is a factor here, and and uh, it gets shit gets weird. I do think there's there appears to be some evidence that Alice Ripley like took some of these fans out to lunch and may have spent some time one on one with them. I think that's a fucking horrible idea if you're like a fifty something actress or a forty something actress and hanging out with 18 and 19 and 20 year olds i just think you're you're like asking for trouble and i do th sure but can't you see the other like the alternative explanation for this would be that she's an incredibly and i don't know if this is true but an incredibly generous person um like maybe it's not a good idea but also that's an incredibly nice thing to do if you are the object of uh, of these fandoms i guess so and if you're if you're a straight woman and there are women it's like okay if i not think it through if, if like a 20 year old reached out to me for writing advice i would try to help them i would i would never get together with them frankly i'd be much more likely to like get a drink with them if they were a dude i never would with a wo so i guess maybe from her right. point of view it's like what could be suspicious here is that because you're afraid of some sort of me too thing i, I mean i wouldn't hit on someone that young but it's just not i would never put myself in that position under any circumstances sure but you like you've mentioned before that when you were younger jonathan chait took you out to lunch no i'm saying i would i would uh if a this, this is not an invitation to anyone listening but it, <laughs> there were there are circumstances where like if we were in the same city and had some third person connection i would like get a drink with a 22 year old oh fuck yeah. i need to think this through if it was a family friend and like a girl a girl a woman wanted writing advice and i had some obligation via family friend no i wouldn't i'm not like mike pence i wouldn't refuse any contact but i would it would be like a thing in my head to get a drink with like a younger person as like a friendly mentorship thing if it was a woman honestly in a way it wouldn't be if it was male maybe i'm overthinking this i don't think you are overthinking this and i saw a study this was about a year after me too um, and I'll find it and we can put a link to the show notes. There was some study out of like management, uh, some like management journal that found that after Me Too, male management types were less likely to mentor women, which seemed like this very ironic and unfortunate side effect of this movement is – actually having less guidance and less opportunity for women because men would be afraid of doing things like meet, meet them in public. Yeah, I'm trying to think this through. It Honestly, it doesn't come up that much. I think I'd get yeah, coffee. No, fucking, I, no, a woman's never – we don't even have to worry about I, it. I've never hung never out happen. with a woman, a woman in public, <laughs> so it's a non-issue. Uh, At least I, not you one know, with I two would, legs. I do think I'm biased in the sense I'd be more likely to say let's grab a beer uh, to like a, a, a male person I was like trying to provide some level of guidance to than a female. I would I would get together with them. It also depends on if it's like a random person or someone you have some um, connection to. Huh, I never thought this through. It's interesting. Anyway, so from Ripley's point of view, 
I guess as a straight woman, she just didn't imagine this could ever happen. Well, now she knows. Anyway, uh, yeah, I feel like I just rambled through some weird shit. So I'm going to get a therapist and talk to that about it. You're, you're, you're processing that. We're working on it. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, there was that. So we just want to up you guys, update you guys on that story. And then oh, well, the other thing was you had mentioned Juno Diaz um, – a couple things here. <laughs> so this was a guy, there were some allegations against him, famous writer. I had uh, written a piece for Reason. Before we started recording, you talked about this story and wondered why no one had ever written about it. <laughs> <laughs> and you said, I did. <laughs> I did. Uh, but during the last episode, you you mentioned an aspect of this I hadn't heard before. And I, I asked you about it where you said someone, uh, he had kissed him on the cheek and they had subsequently been like, he tried to kiss me. and But we're not sure where you got this, right? Right. So I remember reading or hearing that – so one of the allegations against Juno Diaz was that he non-consensually kissed a woman who who publicly made this allegation who was a writer. And I heard uh, or read somewhere um, that it was in a group of people and he like kissed them all like in greeting. I cannot remember where I heard that. I can't find anything online about it. I feel like I might have heard it on a podcast. I might have heard it on the back channel – It might not be true, frankly, because we can't find the source for this now. I'm pretty sure I didn't dream it. I definitely didn't intentionally make it up. Um, but just so people are aware, the, the source for that is as, as of yet unknown. If you have also heard this thing, if you might have been listening to the same podcast as me and you remember it, or you might have been in the same back channel conversation with me and I wasn't supposed to repeat this ever, let me know. I'm curious. Where did this come from? Did I dream it? Who knows? Yeah, I'll include a link to my piece and reason about this. It, there was, in this case, there was an allegation of a kiss, but there was nothing about that came out then about it being on the cheek. There were other allegations that seemed to be, one of them was clearly false that he had yelled at a woman during a, a bookstore reading. Luckily, there was audio of it. Although you said that, that audio is now hard to find. I can, I looked for it a couple of months ago for some reason and I couldn't find it. Uh, okay, so we think we we're we're not gonna like correct this because we're not sure, but we we're not sure the source of the cheek thing. We just want to clarify that. Yep, it's a uh, it's not a correction; it's a non-correction correction. Yes, we're also we should announce that when we do do a live show, we had initially said we're gonna kiss each and every audience member on the cheek. <laughs> we don't think that's a good idea. Only because of COVID. I will only kiss the male ones on the cheek. <laughs> That's totally fair. I, I, me too. I will only kiss the male ones. Hashtag me too. Along those same lines, we, we are, um, the potential of a live show this fall is diminishing because of Delta variant things. We should just update people. Uh, it's not going to happen mid September. We were talking to the venue earlier, uh, last week, I guess. Earliest it'll happen is mid October. That's looking pretty shaky. Shit's just kind of weird right now. Yep. It's definitely weird. All right. Should we proceed with the actual, the show? Yes, let's do that. Let's do this. Katie, I'm looking forward to this next segment because you and I love talking about video games. You're right. There's absolutely nothing I like to talk about better than Tetris. <laughs> All right, Katie. I, uh, I'm going to call this segment The Legend of the Horny Sword. Oh, God. I'm already disgusted. <laughs> do you know – I've got a couple of questions before we get going. Do you know what a so-called dungeon crawler is? Of course not. <laughs> I guess. A dungeon crawler? I mean, it yeah. sounds like some sort of uh, – like a creature that lives in dungeons. Yeah. Like a go- does... golem kind of creature. Yeah, or like a, a podcast listener just sort of hunched, <laughs> hunched in the dark corner. Um, okay, a dungeon crawler is a genre of game where you basically – you make your way through a dungeon, you kill monsters, and so-called loot pops out, like gold and different weapons, and you can equip your character. I've never played a video game, but this is what I've heard, a dungeon uh-huh, crawler. Uh-huh. I definitely I definitely did not dump hundreds of hours into uh, Diablo 2. Uh, do you know what a dating sim is? It sounds like a sex toy. Sort of. A dating sim is a video game. I associate it with the Japanese just because I – I don't know. This could be a stereotype, but I find them to be very horny. Uh, it's like a <laughs> – Usually an anime style game where you literally like date different people and you can choose different dialogue options of like you try to woo them. Um, I have played a lot of dungeon crawlers. I've never played a dating sim, but but you're with me so far, right? Wait, 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 wait. I, I mean, I I believe that this exists, but so it's the point of you're like sitting around on the couch arguing about to watch on TV. What is like? What's the point of this game? Well, so I think it depends on how our X rated it is. I think there's some dating sims that include like pretty graphic sex. Some are more just gotcha. like you want to fall in love and get married, stuff like that. Oh, this is I'm depressed already. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. So if you ever get in a fight with your wife, you can pull up a dating sim and simulate getting in a fight with your wife. Why would I do that? I don't know. This is what did you? There's okay. literally <laughs> one of the a, a well a good selling game right now is literally it simulates mowing the lawn. I'm not making that up. Is this for people who don't have lawns, or are these for people who like are letting their grass grow while they while they sit inside and mow the lawn? I wish I knew, but there's like there's if there's a market for people who will control a simulated lawnmower, there's a market for people like horny shit. I see. Okay, so enter Boyfriend Dungeon. This is a new game. Uh, I think it's for the Nintendo Switch, maybe other platforms too. I forgot to check, and honestly, who cares? It's a combination of a dungeon crawler and a dating sim. So. Katie, just watch watch the YouTube video I included there, and, and let's get your reaction in real time. Boyfriend Dungeon. Okay, there's some music. Looks like anime faces. Oh, like a Fabio type guy with a rose in his mouth. Date your weapons. Um, it's like a like a. Uh, it looks like Sim City kind of, but with um, with yeah, like with little dudes with with swords and stuff. Like they're <laughs> battling. They all these all these characters look very non-binary to me. <laughs> So you, so <laughs> I don't know why I just, I was curious to get your response to that. Okay. So that's, that's the game. The game includes a content warning at the beginning. This game may include references to unwanted advances, stalking, and other forms of emotional manipulation. Play with care. You choose, it's like a very woke game. You choose your character's pronouns when you're creating your character, according to a screenshot posted to Twitter. So here's what the Daily Dot, one of our favorite websites said. While the content warning for Boyfriend Dungeon isn't specific, it's referring to the game's primary antagonist, a man named Eric with whom your character is set up for a date. According to IGN's review, Eric's behavior, which includes intimidation and stalking, quickly becomes worrisome. And those interactions are vital to completing Boyfriend Dungeon's main story. Per Pink News' review, Eric also misgenders a non-binary character at one point, worst of all. A, a fictional non-binary character, to be clear. Is misgendered by another fictional fictional gotcha. character. Gotcha. I I don't think this game should be legal based on what I'm hearing so far. Okay, so so you're with me so far. There's this game. It warns you right when you start it. This game has some heavy themes. If you don't want to be exposed to those themes, don't play it. Right. Right. Yeah. The this quote unquote controversy kicked off when Matthew Arcilla, managing editor at a site called Xbox Outsider, and I believe a, a legal adult. Here's what he wrote on August 13th. The game quickly establishes that this guy is utter nuclear waste, a completely radioactive, toxic person. That's great, sure. But he's also a stalker. He won't stop texting you no matter how rude you are to him. Can't even block his number. I did not consent to this. I know for some games this is just par for the course, but it's 2021 and I didn't ask Boyfriend Dungeon to place me into an extremely distressing situation which, from what I can tell, I cannot opt out of. Some reminded me there's a content warning, and I'm like, okay, I thought that meant backstory elements, not, quote, things that will happen to you, end quote. Okay, so did he, like, give this fictional guy his number? How is he being texted? Or is he being – is this part of the game? That's part of the game. You're texted in the game. You respond to text messages. So why doesn't he just turn the game off if he doesn't <laughs> want to get texted? I mean, uh, <laughs> I can, I love that line. I cannot opt out. Yeah, you can. I can turn it off. That's opting out. I cannot opt out. Uh, there's a really good line from Tyler, the creator, that includes. Do you know what I'm referring to about cyberbullying? No, but Tyler, the creator, is a rapper. Yeah. Google Tyler, the creator, cyberbullying. Oh, oh, I do know this sign. Uh, I don't think we're allowed to say this. We're not. So this is from a tweet from 2012. Tyler, the creator, tweeted, How the fuck is cyberbullying real? Ha ha ha. Soft in, inward. Just walk away from the screen like soft in, inward. Close your eyes. Ha ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> and like – that's one thing because okay, it's obviously funny, but it is like if you're if you're a middle schooler and you're being cyber bullied by your peers, it's still real. In this case, it's a grown adult saying that he's being stalked in a video game that he could turn off at any time. But no, he cannot opt out, Jesse. He can't opt out. I cannot opt out of this game I have chosen to play. I wonder if he paid for the game that he did, that he now feels like he can't opt out. Maybe it's just that. It's just like I paid for it. I have to do it. Some cost like, like joining a gym. Yeah. So to their credit, I think like even 
video games journalists who who usually suck did not take the outrage bait here. But on the other hand, there's a, a, a site called Screen Rant that I think does a lot of like film and video game stuff. This is a direct quote. On Twitter, Alexander Gross, the voice actor for Eric in Boyfriend Dungeon, Eric is the bad dude, spoke out <laughs> – I can't even get through this. Spoke out about players sending him hateful messages for the actions of the character he played in the game. <laughs> Wait, so he's hey, being I- cyberbullied now? <laughs> Eric's boyfriend, bad yes. boyfriend is being cyberbullied? Okay. He, he, he wrote on Twitter, Hey, I can't believe I have to address this, but please don't send me hate messages about my character in Boyfriend Dungeon. <laughs> I know, I know he sucks, but I'm just the voice actor. Please be respectful. Oh my god, people are so dumb. Oh, I hate this whole story. It's so awesome because it's just like the the far extreme end of the whole like you get points for finding stuff to feel oppressed by or to be victimized by. So okay, so the guy who was complaining that there wasn't a more specific trigger warning, what was his name? I want to say who cares, but it was Matthew Ar- Arcilla Arkilla. Okay, so did Matthew? Did he get cyberbullied after posting this incredibly embarrassing tweet? He must have because his his Twitter account went private, which is like the uh, universal symbol of help. I'm being bullied. Yeah, absolutely. I hate to say it, we should never blame the victim, but in this case, he kind of brought it on himself. <laughs> what was it the Gawker who said like we need to bully nerds more? Yeah, yeah. Um, they should uh, in the next edition of, of of Boyfriend Dungeon. They should incorporate the Matthew character, <laughs> the whiner. Oh my god! Well, I'm uh, glad I was able to pollute your brain with that story, Katie. Any any further comments or questions? Fuck you, Jesse. Fuck you. <laughs> All right, we will be right back after this. Jesse, we're running a little behind today, so let's just read directly from the script the advertiser sent us. Uh, will you pull that up for me? All right, I got it. Okay, just read there from the top. Hello, Tushy. The modern bidet company washes away even the messiest of poops, leaving you with a better clean than toilet paper. Then it says, discuss your worst poop experiences and how Tushy could have helped. Uh, Well? Okay, I was playing Boyfriend Dungeon and... uh, (laughs) <laughs> right, actually, no. Next line. Is your butt clean enough to sit on the couch naked? No. Get a tushy. The modern bidet that attaches directly to your toilet in under 10 minutes. That is an absolutely horrifying mental image. Please continue. If you got poop on any other part of your body, you would just wipe it off, right? No, you'd wash it. Stop wiping and start washing with Hello Tushy, the modern bidet attachment that attaches directly to your toilet. Then it says, insert personal story with the tushy sent to you. Katie, why don't you take that one? Um, actually, I think I'll decline to tell a personal poop story, but I will say the ads might be shitty, but the product really is great. In fact, it is so great that using a toilet without a Hello Tushy modern bidet attachment is a literal pain in the ass. Start washing with a Hello Tushy bidet for a better clean. Go to hellotushy.com slash barpod to get 10% off plus free shipping. This is a special offer for our listeners at hellotushy.com slash barpod for 10% off. After you buy and install your Tushy, show it off. Tag us and... And at Hello Toshi on Instagram. Thank God we're not on Instagram. That's hellotoshi.com slash barpot. All right. So this is uh, the housekeeping segment of the show. We'll try to get through it quickly because we got a lot to do. So, um, wow, that was a really good segue. Blocked reported podcast at gmail.com if you want to get in touch. Reddit.com slash r slash blocked and reported for all your subredditing needs. Someone just asked me about setting up an IRL gathering and I referred him to the uh, subreddit because I think people do that there. Um, barpod.org, the world's leading supplier of merchandise of all types. What else? We have a Patreon. If you go to patreon.com slash blocked and reported for just $5 a month, you get three extra, extra episodes of this podcast every month. There are lots of other goodies. You get uh, monthly, bi-monthly hangouts. We do Ask Me Anything. It's a great community. It's the best deal in media. And we are also doing the Bar Pod personal service. We are. I should just add that um, Boyfriend Dungeon costs $20 to download on Steam. So that right there, if you just skip Boyfriend Dungeon, that's four months. That's four months. Yeah. yeah. And yes, you will get some personals. This is a system <laughs> s- soon to be discontinued. Flawless, flawless system. So basically, if you're on Patreon, send us a message with your personal. We will read it on air. If you like what you hear, 
email barpodpersonals at gmail.com, which Katie insists she is checking religiously. Every day. And she'll take the step of connecting people. I um a couple observations. One is that I'm I'm very behind. There's a shitload more we need to get through. I think we're committed to getting through any that come by the end of August, but then we're gonna we're gonna stop because it's just too many. They're getting, as you'll see, Katie, they're getting like kinkier and more desperate as the end approaches. <laughs> it's sort of like a very 2 a.m. in the yeah, bar, yeah. last call type of feel. Everybody's looking around before the lights come on. Me, single 35-year-old white cis male web developer living in Detroit, Michigan. I'm a homeowner and dog owner. Hobbies include reading, playing drums, and listening to podcasts that could get me canceled. Seeking cis female for normie old-fashioned dating scenario and possible relationship. Well, that's transphobic. Yeah, fuck that guy. Like the first guy to start eating at a party or the first vaccinated person in the friend group to stop wearing masks, I figured I'd get this dating service going. I'm a 24-year-old guy in Echo Park who works in the music industry and likes running tattoos and transphobic newsletters of all kinds. Open to meeting a girl in Los Angeles to go to concerts and dunk on bad treat- tweets with. 31-year-old gay male pub manager and thought criminal, non-queer, non-alphabet, currently applying for med school in Scotland, WLTM. Katie, you're, you're a gay. What does that mean? I think that means seeking, basically. Okay. Would like to meet. Oh, would like to meet. Gay man within UK, 22 to 45-year-old, for romance and conversation. Silence is most definitely not violence. Unless you meet previous description, don't get in touch, in which case you are literally guilty of murder. Yep. 66-year-old single white female in Atlanta seeking a chill, fun-loving man. Since Jesse Single is too young, second best will be 57, 58 to 70. Uh, no baggage allowed. Be, par- be prepared to enjoy life. Aww. I love that. I love that there's a, 60, a 66-year-old woman um, using this. Me too. And that a date she would have considered an older me dateable, which is high praise. Look, nobody's perfect. <laughs> I'm Adam, a software engineer in Hawaii. Ooh, I would date anyone in Hawaii. I'm 26 straight and single, an exhaustive list of everything I enjoy is as follows. Birds, mountain hiking, planes, boats, electric longboards, cooking rice-based dishes, and moral philosophy. Also, I'm at least 30% tattooed. Move to Hawaii in an attempt to drop off the face of the planet. If you've also dropped off the face of the planet, uh, he'd enjoy... Getting a drink. 25-year-old lesbian seeking girlfriend. I live in Queens, New York. I'm a professional dancer and model who works as a paralegal as well. Writing a book about how lesbians are going extinct. Someone is stealing my idea. Must love dogs and people to challenge me. If you're vegan, we probably won't get along. I'm a great cook and will make you anything you want as long as it's not vegan. In terms of just like on paper qualities, I feel like that's one of the best we've gotten. Not being vegan? No. 25-year-old model... Professional dancer, day job, dogs. Okay, that's pretty good, yeah. Williamsburg unhipster, a 50-something Brooklyn history prof with most of his teeth and a dad's sense of humor, seeks snarky woman who prefers books to yoga. This single white male has a nerd side but can pass as mostly normal. Bicycle everywhere, bench press in my dreams. Great legs, great sense of humor. 29-year-old straight male in Portland, Oregon, seeking someone who doesn't think Joe Rogan is the devil. I'm currently focused on my career and deciding on next steps in life. Part of me wants to travel as a digital nomad. Part of me wants chickens. Warning, I forgot how to talk about anything other than Bitcoin. Ooh, good luck, dude. (laughs) Tremendous mammary glands. Straight early 30s female, Chicago. Church-going contrarian with thoughtfully shelved books and a preternaturally adorable Bichon Frise. Is that how you pronounce it? Sure. (laughs) <laughs> by sean Frizy. stable active and smart expect same normies welcome for friends too title comes from a date i didn't walk out on i would have preferred great tits i'm a cheerful energetic problematically class reductionist 27 year old woman in manhattan i love musicals and 70s music and i'm currently writing my fourth musical 70s movies okay whatever i'm currently writing my fourth <laughs> musical seeking a cheerful energetic nyc based man 25 to 35 who likes to walk a lot Bonus points if you look like a reasonable facsimile of Richard Dreyfuss in 1977. Uh, we might need to tell Ben Dreyfuss about this one. <laughs> I was going to say. We have the van for you. Chicago kink guy. Howdy. 28-year-old poly male seeking female in the kink world. I realize I'm totally declassing the podcast by bringing up kink, but the community can be so overly woke, I can't pass up the opportunity to meet a cynical bar pod listener. Just to be even less classy, I'll say that my main kink is ABDL. What does that mean? We're going to have to look that up. One moment, please. Also, does this guy not give... Oh, Chicago can guys. Chicago. The kinkiest city in the world. Ah. Uh, paraphilic... Ooh. <laughs> oh, no. What is it? Oh, man. Uh-oh. He's an adult baby. Does the D stand for diaper? Adult baby diaper lover. Okay. Um, we're. You know what? We're open-minded. Yeah. To each his own. Yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> I love this title. 33 and single, S-I-N-G-A-L, in search of her, parentheses, Zog. Very clever. Straight Christian man seeking straight Christian woman. Likes reading, writing, anime, Magic the Gathering, video games, philosophy, not murdering. Hmm. Dislikes, heights, pickles, driving, murdering. <laughs> Located in <laughs> Bellingham, Washington, oldest of six kids, working as a caregiver since 2010. Most adult thing he's done is buy a condo. Friends would describe me as hasn't murdered a single person, thinks he's funny, and I guess a good friend. A lot more stuff, but that's that's the gist of it. P.S. I'm not a murderer. So it seems like the main thing I'm getting from this guy is that he's pretty open that he's not a murderer. Moving on. Toronto Wallflower. Toronto female, 30, seeks kind, smart male in his 30s. Subscribes to the Larry David School of Thought that, quote, a date is an experience you have with another person that makes you appreciate being alone. So if you'd like to appreciate being alone together, reach out. No equine er 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 inquiries, please. Cool. Uh, from Cuddler Wars, literally nonviolent 38-year-old male, titless liberal, but in the actual sense not the American one, looking for intelligent people, great, big, or unremarkable racks. Welcome. Cons, am in Switzerland. Pros, am in Switzerland. All right. I think that's it for this week. We have a bunch more. Uh, please, if you want to take part in this, get us your ads by the end of the month, and then we're going to cut it off. We will continue to read everyone's until we get through, but we are wrapping it up. Yeah, we'll be done reading them in by the end of uh, the second Kamala Harris administration. All right. Thanks to everyone who sent this in. Remember, you can join us at patreon.com slash blocked and reported. Jesse, what do you know about Megan Murphy? Megan Murphy is a nice woman who people – she has problemat- some genuinely problematic views on trans stuff. I was interviewed by her on her YouTube thing. She's been deplatformed from Twitter. She's like gender critical, radical feminist type uh, and so forth. You're sort of right and sort of wrong about that, and you will hear why when we get to the interview. Megan does not actually identify herself as a radical feminist, but she is the uh, editor-in-chief, the founder and editor-in-chief of The Feminist Current, a Canadian-based website, although she has been living in Mexico for the the past few months, as you mentioned. She was permanently banned from Twitter. She sued Twitter. That suit failed, so it doesn't look like there will be any recourse with her, and she was kind enough to join us on the podcast. This is probably like – you know, we obviously speak pretty openly about a lot of stuff. This is one of those ones where people have very strong feelings about her because she she strongly argues against the idea that trans women are women. What what made you? I mean, you did initiate this. I initiated Ethan Strauss last week. But what what made you like want to d- get into it with her? Because it's a really good interview, and you talk about a lot of stuff. You know, I just wanted to have another vagina have her on the podcast. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. No, Megan interests me because she's gone through uh, a, what I see as a pretty interesting shift. When I and we talk about this in the interview, but when I first learned of her and first started reading her work, she was incredibly dogmatic. And I've met her in person, and through my conversations with her, I have found that she is actually not that dogmatic. And she's been going through what is a pretty interesting political shift over the past couple of years. So she's not exactly. I think what people think about her, I think that she's gotten um, misrepresented in uh, in the media quite a bit. And uh, she's just a sort of all around interesting woman who is like not afraid to speak her mind. She's incredibly honest. And I appreciate that, that about her. Yeah. Yeah. I hope uh, people enjoy this. We're going to do a long, we're going to do the whole thing for patrons and, and a good chunk of it now for everyone else. Right. Yep. All right. So let's go to Megan Murphy. Megan Murphy, thank you for coming on Blocked and Reported. Hello, happy to be here. I'm glad to book you because you were just on Joe Rogan, and I was afraid that you would your celebrity would have bloomed too too high for me. Mm-hmm. I'm too famous for you now. I mean, I'd already yeah. said that I would do it, so I, I try to keep my word. But you're right now. Now I'm too big time. <laughs> <laughs> thank God I asked you before the Rogan appearance. How was that? Oh, it was so fun. It was like. Yeah, it was, I mean, one of my peak moments. I'm like a big fan of his also. And um, I was not only glad to, you know, speak for myself after hearing what Jack Dorsey and um, the woman who's the head of head of safety over there essentially like lie about why they banned me from Twitter, which apparently was because I was busily harassing trans people all the time on the internet. That's my favorite mm-hmm. thing to do. Um, it's a weird hobby, but you know what? We all need some way to pass the time. <laughs> I don't have like work or anything like that. <laughs> we'll get to your Twitter ban in a second, but I'm curious, after the Rogan interview, have you seen a big spike in listeners or viewers of your podcast? Um, I mean, my I've gotten like a ton, a ton, a ton of new followers on 
Instagram, which is great. I mean, it like, and you know, the more subscribers on YouTube. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's hard to build an audience and, and obviously I spent a lot of time building an audience on Twitter. I'm, you know, independent. I'm an independent writer. I produce my own podcast. I essentially do everything myself. I don't work for anyone else. So, um, I'm responsible for, for building my own audience and for funding my work essentially. Um, and unfortunately that means that I'm totally dependent on things like social media platforms in order to reach, reach an audience. And, um, so after I was kicked off Twitter, I sort of had to scramble to try to build new platforms from scratch. You know, I didn't have a public Instagram account or a public Facebook account. Um, I hadn't done anything with my YouTube channel until then. And all of a sudden I was like, Oh, cool. I'm going to start from the beginning. <laughs> So it has been useful in that way, yeah. So I want to get into your Twitter banning in a little bit. But first, let's sort of go back in history a little bit. So I first discovered you in 2017 when I was doing research for my piece uh, in The Stranger about detransitioners. And what I would like to do is I would like for you to describe your political beliefs at that time, let's say like four or five years ago. And the reason is because one of the things that fascinates me about you is that you've gone through a, a political evolution um, in a way that I think oftentimes activists don't. So let's just go back in time a little bit. Describe your political positions from around 2016, 2017. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, for my whole life, identified as a socialist. I even, there was a point, you know, when I was a teenager um, that I identified as a Marxist um, and obviously identif I've identified as a feminist for as long as I can remember, you know, honestly, probably since I was like 11 years old. Um, I came from a very a super leftist family um, my dad was uh, a postie and he was really involved in the union there. Um, What's a postie? Is that like a Oh, you work for the post office, sorry. Gotcha. <laughs> post person. Oh, you don't know post office lingo, huh? Um, no, we call them um, we call them mail carriers here because postman is uh, is uh, too too patriarchal, so we call them mail carriers. Oh, okay, okay, you progressed beyond me. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> so, and you know, my mom my mom was a feminist, and so. I was like, like when I was a kid, I was like marching off to the principal's office complaining about sexism in the classroom and stuff like that. <laughs> so I've been doing this for a very long time. Um, and, you know, up until very recently, like up until maybe a year or two ago, I think I was still identifying as a socialist. And I, I really, not only did I think that the right was bad. I didn't even really know anybody on the right. Most of my life, everyone that I knew was progressive. The people that I thought were my enemies were like centrists, <laughs> not even the right. I was like, oh, these liberals, <laughs> like they're not left enough for me. Um, or like even the liberal feminists, you know, I never identified as a radical feminist per se, but I always said that, you know, my feminism was rooted in radical feminism and I was constantly criticizing and mocking women who weren't radical enough in their feminism, who were just, you know, as far as I was concerned, focused on quite superficial issues. You know, I, I, I took this position of sort of everybody not really being radical enough. Um, and at a certain point, I started to branch out a bit. And I stopped listening to and engaging only with people who saw things in the exact same way as me, um, which I know is like a really awful thing to do these days. Um, <laughs> and I started to question my own ideologies um, and beliefs and arguments and started to challenge myself and be challenged more. Um, and, you know, to be honest... Once I was kicked off Twitter, I, you know, a lot of right wing people and, you know, centrists and libertarians and people that I really hadn't engaged with too much in the past reached out to me and supported me. And so I started um, interviewing people who had different perspectives than I had, who, you know, weren't these extreme leftists or maybe weren't feminists or whatever. And 
I also at that time, to be perfectly honest, was really getting kind of intellectually bored. Like I started to feel like I was just repeating myself over and over and over again. And I started to feel like, it was like, I'm not like bringing anything new to the table. I'm not learning anything new. These ideas feel stale to me. And I don't even know if they're good ideas. Like if you're not being challenged on your ideas, then you, they're probably not great ideas. Like, how do you know that this is like a solid ideology or argument or concept if nobody is challenging you on them? So, and I didn't want to just be kind of preaching to the choir. You know, I don't want to just be engaging with people who see things in the exact same way as me. That's not interesting. And I don't think it's productive. Right. So when I met you, uh, so we met in person for the first time a couple years ago when you were in Seattle for an event. Um, this was an event at the Seattle Public Library. There were, of course, massive protests. The library did hold the event. They held, held it after hours, um, despite many, many calls from, from activists and from some local leaders to can the entire thing. But the, uh, the head of the library, thankfully, um, you know, made a, a, a sort of milquetoast, but ultimately in this age, compelling statement about the need for intellectual diversity and, and for free speech. So we met for the first time during that. Um, so we got, we got drinks the night before, got dinner the night before. And I remember sort of being nervous to meet you because my impression of you from reading your work for the few years before that was that you were pretty doctrinaire. And I know that you don't uh, that you never sort of adopted the label radical feminist yourself, but your 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 politics were pretty in line, as far as I could tell, with radical feminism. But what I found when I met you is that you and I had sort of gone through this similar evolution. So I think I, I started out the conversation with you saying something like, I don't identify as a feminist anymore, and here's why. And my my rationale for this is the same reason that I don't identify as something like an environmentalist, even though I, I hold most of the principles of conservation and, environmental, and, and environmentalism dear, not all, but some. And the, but the reason that I s stopped identifying as a feminist or any of these other things is because I realized at some point that when your identity is wrapped up in these labels, is wrapped up in these movements, it becomes really hard to evaluate those movements on their merits because it is more important at some point, and this is, I'm generalizing here, this isn't true for everybody, but for me, what I realized was that if I identify with feminism, if, if being a feminist is a, is a strong part of who I am, then it becomes harder for me to evaluate the movement. And it also becomes uh, being right is almost more important than being correct. And I remember sort of explaining this to you and feeling like, is she going to understand this? Like, I'm like, this is Megan Murphy, radical feminist. And you were basically like, yeah, I'm in the same place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I, <clears throat> it's, I've been trying to talk about this, for a while now and it's been really difficult because I'll say things like you know I am I'm clearly advocating for women's rights I clearly am a feminist but I don't want to attach myself to labels and identities anymore you know for the reasons that you explain and people if you call yourself a feminist then people will put you in a box and demand that you hold certain views and that you make certain arguments and that you repeat certain mantras. And I don't want to do that because I'm not going to repeat a mantra that I don't believe in just because that's what you do as a feminist. And this is what you're supposed to say as a feminist. And this is what you're supposed to believe as a feminist. And, you know, unfortunately, recently I've gotten a lot of like backlash and kind of hate and attacks from radical feminists because I have been, you know, I'm, I want to be equally as critical of radical feminism as I am of any other movement. Um, it's, you know, it's an ideology, it's activism, just like anything else. It's not, it's not inherently good or bad or better than other movements and activism. And I do find that, you know, radical feminists are so attached to this label and this identity and this ideology that they do kind of think it's the best argument and ideology and they're they're operating within silos in many cases so they're not being challenged on 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 their views or if they are challenged they take it as an attack you know um and so and i think this happens in all movements and all people who are like super attached to any particular ideology i think this isn't specific to radical feminists you know i'm not not trying to pick on them per se but it's like okay but well i've been 
critical of all these other things. And I want to, you know, think independently about movements and ideas and arguments and activism. So why should I not treat radical feminism in the same way? Um, you know, and I've just seen all sorts of women on the internet who identify as radical feminist, essentially being like, well, Megan Murphy's trash now, like throw her in the garbage. Like, you know, she's questioning these ideas. She's nothing. I don't know what's happened to her. They've also said really horrible sexist things about me. Like they call me like a pick me and a ball palmer. A ball palmer? They think that I'm, yeah, you know, someone who (laughs) palms balls. (laughs) Wait, wait, like, like tickles the taint? Is that, is that a thing? They haven't been specific about like what that means, but I mean, that's what I I, like, you know, they called me a ball palmer and I was like, well, yeah, like (laughs) you are, you are, I'm I'm literally a ball palmer. I'm a heterosexual woman. That is maybe the most surprising thing about you is that you are an actual heterosexual woman. Um, Yeah. I I do. I have sex with men. (laughs) How dare you? How dare you? (laughs) Gross, right? I mean, actually, Um, yes, I do find that pretty disgusting. I know. You you know what? You probably do find that actually gross. (laughs) To each his own. I won't judge. I won't judge. Okay, so I want to get specific for a moment. So one of my major conflicts with not just radical feminism, but some aspects of regular feminism, is that I do think there is a sort of blank slateism in some thinking. This idea that everything is everything is socially constructed. Gender is entirely con- socially constructed. The only reason that uh, women are in the position they are and men are in the position they are or interested in the things that they are, whatever – that this is that this is all social this is all the patriarchy and i just don't believe that because i think that biology has a, a lot not entirely but has a lot to do with these things i believe in both nature and nurture and i think that testosterone in particular or the lack of testosterone in particular does have uh, a massive impact on on behavior on emotions and on things like that so i'm i'm curious for me at least that's one of the that's one of the places where I diverge from feminism. I also, just looking at the history of, of feminist involvement in some movements, I mean, feminists were integral to the uh, the satanic panic and the repressed memory craze. Some aspects of Me Too that I find really troubling are, are based on feminist tenets. So I'm curious for you, where do you deviate from feminism right now? Um, I mean, I I do think that Feminists, especially radical feminists, focus much too heavily on the nurture versus nature thing when it comes to gender and gender roles. Um, I will say that, and, and, you know, and I participated in that for almost my whole life. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. only started. You've, you've, started. you've talked about patriarchy a lot. Yeah. The, yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, and I did really believe that men's behavior was all socialized and that therefore we could unsocialize them as it were and that women's behavior was socialized also i really rejected the idea that anything about men's behavior or women's behavior had to do with nature or biology or evolution and i think that you know feminists reject that because they're afraid and you know fair enough they're afraid that if you say that men's behavior is natural, then that will be used as a, as a way to justify male violence or rape or sexual assault or, you know, essentially sexist behavior. But the reality is that, you know, some of that behavior and a lot of our interactions as men and women in society are connected to evolution and therefore, you know, our nature, biology, whatever. And it doesn't mean that people can't change. Of course, people change. I mean, we've seen incredible revolutionary change throughout history. I mean, not so long ago, women really couldn't vote. And it was expected that women stay out of public life. And that's no longer the case in the West. Um, So, you know, I don't think that those fears are justified to the point where we need to insist that every single thing about male and female behavior is socialized and we can change it all. I mean, there is obvious evidence that, you know, boys and girls play in different ways, um, for example. And I mean, as far as gender goes, I have really rejected gender as a necessary concept for a long time only because I you know, I support the idea that people should just be whoever they are. You know, I don't believe that 
women and girls should have to be feminine or are feminine. You know, I don't believe that all women and girls are inherently passive and irrational and over emotional and nurturing. And I know that in part from personal experience, you know, I'm really not very nurturing. <laughs> I'm, really not <laughs> I'm not interested in babies. I think they're gross. <laughs> have you ever had your T levels checked? <laughs> Maybe I'm trans. <laughs> it, 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 I would be fascinated to know Megan Murphy's sea levels, which I am guessing are higher than your average like Brooklyn media dude. I wonder. I wonder. <laughs> I should get that checked. Um, you know, and when I was a kid, like I, I was like, I wanted to be like a tomboy. Like I wanted to be like Pippi Longstocking and like Punky Brewster. And um So I just, I never, I never thought I was a boy, but I just, I sort of rejected girl things. And, and, you know, of course there's, there's lots of little boys who like girl things, you know, there's lots of little boys who like want to do ballet and wear dresses and play with dolls. Um, But at the same time, you know, there are, there are patterns. So when we say, you know, that boys and girls play in different ways, it doesn't mean that every single boy and every single girl follows these sure. um, patterns. It just means that we see these these patterns broadly, as of course you know. But I mean, so that's sort of why I, as from a feminist perspective, have rejected gender as a concept, things like masculine and femininity, and why I sort of feel frustrated when we we focus on gender versus sex. You know, my argument is that, you know, you're male or female, but, you know, be who you are. Behave However you want to behave, you know, men can be feminine if they want to be feminine. Women can be masculine. There's obviously for most people, I think it's a real mix of the two. You know, like I don't know that many people who are all, I don't think I know any people that are all one thing. You know, the men I don't know are mas- are, they aren't masculine by the book, you know, in every single way and vice versa. So I just sort of think that they're not super necessary concepts that masculinity feminine anything yeah and the concept of gender itself is really muddy so when i think of gender what the easiest way for me to sort of explain it to myself is to when i hear the word gender just just substitute the word gender roles for gender because i think that's what it's actually explaining but to a lot of people not i I think you or i but to a lot of other people gender identity is this almost this thing that is inside of you like a like a soul i don't really believe in the soul so so it's not that hard for me to reject Mm -hmm. the concept of gender identity at all but you see like today i saw on some like tiktok thing that was going around someone talking about the concept of libra gender and it's just this it's these like these right right i cannot i could not actually tell you what that means it means like sometimes you, yeah like sometimes you identify as I'm a gender Libra, so right. you I are have that You're, yes you have it it's actually a disease um but it has become so silly and but at, but at the same time so sacrosanct and one of the things that bothers me about the entire conversation around gender is that we're supposed to just believe what people say about their genders without analyzing it, without saying what is going on here? What the fuck is Libra gender? What are you talking about? Um, you know, it's just like adopting more and more labels to describe things that might not even exist. And that you don't really need to describe. Like you could just say, I like wearing dresses. No, no. <laughs> or whatever it is. Like you don't have to identify as anything. And, you know, I, I agree with you that, that what I, I'm frustrated by the same thing, but I'm also frustrated because within this conversation around gender identity, people have completely conflated gender and sex. And I, yes. you know, have been running around for many years trying to correct people and nobody listens to me. Right. <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I'm saying, you know, you say you can't change sex and then people will say, but you know, what, why can't people identify as the gender they want to? And I said, and I'm just like, I'm not talking about that. I'm saying that you can't change your biology. Like a male, somebody who is biologically male, it cannot become biologically female. And again, you do you, but just because you like feminine things doesn't make you a female if you're male. I'm not female because of femininity. I'm female because I have a female body. That's it. Right. I want to get to the trans stuff in a moment, but first of all, can you just briefly define to me what patriarchy is and where you see it in the West? No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I just... <laughs> oh 
my God, 2017 Megan Megan Murphy <laughs> is rolling over in her grave. I I know. I okay. I said this on Rogan actually, um, <clears throat> which was that you know part of my sort of questioning of feminism was that I started to realize that I was saying all these words that I didn't know if I could actually define. Mm -hmm. You know, I would say, you know, well, because of patriarchy, because of patriarchy. And that's what feminists are trained to say. And so they don't question it. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to, it's not even necessarily their fault, although I do wish that they would think more critically about what they're saying, but it's that, you know, they're, they're told by you know, feminist elders and by women's studies or whatever it is. Well, it's because of patriarchy. It's because of patriarchy. There's the system that exists and it's called patriarchy and it's oppressing women. It's a mantra. And, yeah. And it's so, like believe science. It's just, it becomes totally meaningless because patriarchy. Right, right. Believe science. And it's like, well, which science, what science are you talking about? Yeah. So I started to be like, I was like, I don't actually think that if questioned, I could really define and describe what patriarchy is and what that looks like in the West. Like I, you know, of course, I do think that this is something that existed in a very obvious way in the past and that continues to exist in other parts of the world. You know, there's parts of the world where literally, yeah, like Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan, exactly, where, you know, women can't do anything without the posi- without the permission of their fathers or a male guardian. You know, I think that's pretty obviously patriarchal. Right. Um, it's a system where men are obviously in power and in power over women. But that's not the case in the West anymore. Um, I mean, I'm sure it is in some, in some communities, you know, you have mm-hmm. these like, uh, LDS, whatever, like hardcore Mormons and, in, in Utah and Colorado where that might exist. But in my life, it's very hard to see where the patriarchy impacts me. Yeah. And my understanding of like Hasidic Jews and, oh, you for know, sure. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, um, Muslim, like, you know, yeah. there's certain religions that are quite patriarchal. So that's true. You know, yeah. I shouldn't say just in the West. But um, I think that it, if we're talking about places like Canada or North America, this isn't in the law. You know, there isn't patriarchal legislation that says, you know, men are in charge of what you do. Is um, that, so So to interrupt you really quickly, so you've been living in Mexico now for several months. Is that, have you found this true as well in Mexico? Or do you think that Mexico is more patriarchal compared to America and Canada? Uh, I mean, I, I do think that, well, I mean, I'm living in like a little surf town on the coast and there's a lot of gringos here. There's also a lot of Mexican people who live here. Um, but, you know, I interact with people from all around the world here, you know, like I have a lot of friends who are American. I have friends here who are from like South Africa and like Canada and Europe and from all sorts of places across Mexico. I do think that Mexican culture is definitely, um, I guess more, it's more machismo for sure. Yeah. More machismo for sure. Um, there is, <laughs> I love Mexico and I, so I don't want to like start dissing Mexico or Mexicans or whatever, but I do find that men have pretty different ideas about dating and how they engage with women here mm-hmm. than for example, Canadian men. And in some ways it's a good thing because Canadian men are super <laughs> passive yeah. and annoying and kind of pathetic and <laughs> very <laughs> aggressive. And, and while I don't want a man who's aggressive to the point of like being violent or scary you know i also left canada being like i don't ever want to date a canadian man ever again like they just don't do anything and (laughs) they don't try they don't like put themselves out there and mexican guys will like go for it and they'll compliment you and they'll pursue you and they'll try to date you um at the same time i think there's this thing where a lot of um mexican men i'm stereotyping here obviously um seem to think, you know, they can have a wife, but also some girlfriends. Right. <laughs> you know sure. what I mean? Like yes. that kind of thing. And that yes. it's, it's, it's more acceptable to like objectify women and stare at women and comment to women and stuff and like that. And lie to them and have a second family for 30 years yeah. until your wife finds out. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and cheat and, you know, see, see prostitutes and things like that. And, you know, those things go on in Canada too, but it, this is sort of a more 
normalized, expected part of the culture here, I find. Okay, so uh, let's um, let's go to how you got involved in the trans debate. What was your first entry into that? So I think I first started trying to talk about it to like approach the issue and understand the issue around 2015. Um, and part of that had to do with the fact that I was seeing feminists that I was working with and allied with being attacked um, and being silenced and being harassed. So, you know, women like Julie Bendel, um, who wrote about um, uh, a case uh, that had to do with Vancouver Rape Relief here in Vancouver, which remains the only, you know, transition house and rape crisis center that maintains a female only policy and have it and really cave to this thing where you have to allow men access if they identify as trans women. But she wrote about a case wherein uh, a male named Kimberly Nixon, who identifies as trans, um, tried to attend the counselor training program at Vancouver Rape Relief. I think this was back in like Oh my God, I'm going to get the date wrong. Like it was a long time ago. Like I think it was like 1999 or something like that. Um, and the women who were doing the training recognized that he was male and was, they were like, no, sorry, you know, only women are allowed to train to become counselors here. So Kimberly Nixon took them to the human rights tribunal. Um, and Vancouver Rape Relief won on the basis that they were allowed to define their own membership. But uh, Julie Bindel wrote about this case um, and so, you know, got attacked as a transphobe in a really vicious way and continued to be attacked for years and years as she continued to speak about this issue. And Vancouver Rape Relief was attacked as transphobic constantly. They were being attacked by, you know, other leftists and they're a super leftist organization, but um, they were being attacked in the community over and over and over again. And I just thought, you know, like I have to... I have to understand this issue and I have to stand up for these women who are my, my allies and, and women who I've learned a lot from in terms of feminism and so on and so forth. So, so I interviewed Lee Lakeman who was involved in Vancouver Rape Relief and headed, well, you really headed up Vancouver Rape Relief for many years, like I think a couple decades. Um, I interviewed Sheila Jeffries who's written about this, this issue of transgenderism for a long time. She's another one who's been attacked as a transphobe, you know, so has Jermaine Greer. Um, so has Janice Raymond, of course. Um, because I thought, you know, like if I'm going to start talking about this issue, I really need to make sure I know what I'm saying. Like this is a controversial issue um, I, I want to get my arguments clear. So I started by just, yeah, like interviewing other women and talking to other women about this. Um, and then things started happening. Like, you know, Laverne Cox was on the cover of Allure magazine and everybody was like, isn't this incredible that this trans woman is being objectified and is naked on the cover of women's women's magazine. And I was like, no, <laughs> I think this is stupid. Um, and then of course, people started calling me transphobic and I, I, uh, and then, and then in 2016, the, uh, our gender identity legislation here in, in Canada came along bill C-16 and I looked at it and thought this is going to have a really negative impact on women and girls. And I felt really concerned about it. Will you, um, describe bill C-16 for me? That's the one that Jordan Peterson spoke out against, right? Yeah. Um, So Bill C-16 was our Canadian gender identity legislation, the bill passed. Um, And, you know, it actually was pretty vague, but what it did was it included gender identity and gender expression in the human rights code and the criminal code. Um, And to me, I thought, you know, we can't have, we can't have, gender identity and sex at the same time, um, that the concept of gender identity nullifies the reality of sex. You know, either you're a woman because you're a female, you're a man because you're male, or everybody just identifies however they want. And that's what defines sex. Either you're, you know, if you, if you have gender identity, gender identity trumps sex. Um, and I had concerns that this would mean that men would be allowed to access women's spaces if they identified as women. This all came to fruition, of course. So I was worried about places like transition houses, shelters, prisons, change rooms, sports, 
um, things like that. And I also felt like the concept itself was really sexist. So I had concerns that this concept was being incorporated into Canadian legislation that essentially said, you know, a woman is defined by femininity and a man is defined by masculinity. Um, I thought this was like a really regressive view because as I said earlier, you know, I don't, I don't believe that you're a man because you're rational or unemotional or aggressive or violent or, you know, because you like trucks or whatever. And um, I don't think that women are defined by feminine behavior, you know, whether or not they like wearing heels and dresses and having long hair and, you know, making babies and things like that. Um, so it was really vague, but, you know, the impact has been that it has shaped policy across Canada. You know, Bill C-16 is used as the reason that, you know, we have to accept men in women's transition houses and shelters and change rooms and prisons and allow men to compete against women in sport. Okay, so let's pause there for a second. So when you say men, and this is something that we disagree on. So when you say men, you're talking about trans women. And my preferred term in a, in a case like this, having this conversation is male, just because I think it uh, is a little bit clearer. But one other difference that we have here is that you misgender people. And I know that the term itself is is like slightly ridiculous. The concept of dead naming, I also find slightly ridiculous. But you do, uh, you do misgender people. You do refer to people by their dead names. And I want to ask you why you do that. <laughs> Well, because I think that it's, um, <laughs> I think that it's a slippery slope. Once we start calling males, you know, who identify as trans women or identify as women, she, I think that this has, and it has, it's not just that I think, it's that it has had an impact on things like journalism and stats, like, you know, on reporting. So men who are, uh, perpetrators of things like sexual assault or domestic abuse or, um, you know, various forms of violence are being referred to as women in the media, in journalism. And it's specifically because this notion of misgendering has been framed as hateful. And it's not hateful. I'm not doing it to be mean. I'm doing it because I don't think that men can become women. And I don't actually think there's any point in referring to a male as she, regardless of how he identifies. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, he can do whatever he wants. I mean, he can get surgery, he can take hormones, he can change his name, he can wear whatever clothes he wants. But that's a personal choice, you know, that doesn't mean that I have to participate in his identity or, you know, his desires or his, sorry, this is going to sound rude, but delusions. Um, and I just think, you know, like it's one thing for one-on-one, -on -one. if you're talking to your friend and they identify as trans, then sure, call them by whatever pronoun they prefer, I guess. I mean, I tend to think that, you know, I, I do have friends who you're, you know, like I've had one-on-one -on -one conversations with people who are transsexual. They tend to identify as transsexual, not transgender. And they're not the kind of people who would insist that they insist to me that the, they actually are the opposite sex and that therefore I must use these pronouns. Like I resent being bullied into calling a man she, and I think it gaslights women. I think that it is a slippery slope. And I think that it sort of reinforces this whole culture of, you know, if a man says he's a woman, then you have to accept that he's a woman. It's, you know, whatever he says is true and you can't say anything. And now you have to let him into the change room with your girls. Um, and it's just, it's not, I mean, why is it insulting to, you know, if somebody is male and I say he, that's not an insult. That's just the pronoun that we use for males. It's not an opinion, you know? I, I get what you're saying, but I look at it a little bit more strategically. And I think that when you misgender someone, what you're doing is you're giving them license to be a victim. And because that's just how this this is perceived in our culture right now. So you become the bad guy. They become the victim. They become more sympathetic. So for me, it's a fairly easy – like, do I think that trans women are literal women? No, of course not. I don't because women are females. Do I think they are trans women? Yes, I do. Like, I have no problem calling somebody by their preferred pronouns, not just because I think it's polite, but also because – 
if I didn't, then I then I become the bad guy. I became the bu- I become the bully. So I just from a political perspective, I just don't know how effective it is. I mean, you were kicked off of Twitter in part because of this. Yeah, and I sort of have the opposite views. I think that strategically and politically, the reason why people think that misgendering is even a thing. I mean, I don't think that it is misgendering. I think it's like correctly sexing, I guess, is how I would put it. But, you know, I think that by, you know, using the pronouns that trans people want us to use, it normalizes the idea that to say he, in reference to a male who identifies as a trans woman, is hateful. So I want to normalize the opposite thing and be like, it's not hateful. It's not an opinion. It's not an insult. It's not mean. And we don't have to go along with this. Like, again, I, I find it really scary that in media and journalism, they would literally report on male violence as though it's female violence. And sometimes you can't even tell within the, the article that this person is trans. I mean, at least if they said, oh, this person is trans, you'd be like, oh, it's not actually a woman. But I still think it's totally unethical either way. They should be reporting on them as males. But you know, it's like you get to the bottom of the article and you're like, that's a really weird thing for a woman to do. And then you, or you, you or you see the, the, the picture of the perpetrator. Yeah. And there's <laughs> the a picture, picture and you're like, hey, that's right. not a lady. <laughs> right, right. There's a there's a headline about how some woman commits some like very, very rare act of violence. And the whole article is about a woman doing this thing. And then you look at the picture and it's like, wait a second, she has a beard. Not that women can't have beards. PCOS is real. It happens. But you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So I just I I don't, I don't want people to feel like they have to participate in this. You know, I, I compare gender identity ideology to a religion. You know, it's a belief system. It's totally faith-based. There's no material reality involved there. You know, it's just something you say, like, this is my gender identity. This is a feeling. This is like my soul. You know, this isn't a tangible thing. Um, and I feel like the the notion of, you know, I don't know, correctly gendering somebody, so using the pronouns they want you to use, reinforces and participates in normalizing and justifying and legitimizing this ideology. And so I think that's that's harmful. Well, so this has hurt besides the multitudes of trans women that you have terrorized by refusing to use their preferred pronouns. This has hurt Megan Murphy. So uh, will you explain what happened when you got banned from Twitter? Right. So um, it's basically, you know, I didn't, I didn't really understand how getting banned from Twitter worked, to be honest. Like I didn't realize that there was this, I guess there's like a three strike system. Like if you, if they shut down your account three times and they'll just ban you. Um, So they shut down my account. They locked my account for, saying, um, men aren't women though. And when they lock down your account, they'll say, you know, you, you can't get your, you're off Twitter for 24 hours. You can't get back on until you delete this tweet. So I was like, okay, whatever, I'll delete the tweet. Um, but in deleting the tweet, I think what that means is you accept the fact that you've broken a rule and I didn't break a rule. Like I wasn't, I wasn't talking about anybody. I wasn't even talking about a trans identified person when I said that it was just in some sort of weird, confusing thread. Um, and I just said, men aren't women though. Um, so they locked me down for that tweet. And then they locked me down for asking what's the difference between a trans woman and a man, which is, you know, a question that I ask often, and it's not to be antagonistic. It's to get people to explain what, this concept means, you know, what does it mean? What, what's the process there between you being a man this day and now you're a trans woman? Like, what does that mean? What happened there? What's the difference between you, the man and you, the trans woman, you know, there isn't any difference. It's just a pronouncement. So that's what I'm trying to get at. Right. But so they locked me down for that. And then finally, um, I, I referred to Jonathan Yaniv, who's, now, I guess, goes by Jessica, who is the guy who went around Vancouver, to, like asking local estheticians to give him a Brazilian bikini wax. <laughs> and when they refused, took them to through- Megan, come on, her, give her a Brazilian bikini wax, a Brazilian <laughs> ball wax. Wax her balls. <laughs> asking them to be ball palmers, in other words. 
<laughs> um, and, you know, when they would realize this person was male would be like, no, we don't offer this service to male. And then he would accuse them of transphobia and try to extort money out of well, them. And one uh, interesting little complication of this story was that the women who Yaniv was approaching were mostly immigrants, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah. They were mostly immigrants. Um, a lot of them were working out of their homes. And so obviously they don't want to be in their home with this clearly strange man, but maybe, or other man. But supposedly, I mean, I don't know anything about waxing men's balls, but supposedly it's a different process. It's a very different process than, you know, waxing a labia. Um, the skin is more sensitive, for example. And they were like, sorry, we don't have the expertise and tools to do this, but I'm sure they also just didn't want to and should have the right to say no to touching a man's balls. Um, and women who are, you know, vulnerable, right? Like alone in their homes with this guy and, uh, and marginalized women as it were. Um, so he took them all through the human rights tribunal. Um, and all of this was just, you know, him trying to make a buck off of this trans trend, essentially. I don't believe that he actually believes he's a woman. Um, I think what ended up happening with, uh, with Yanni, that story sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, disappeared. Well, he lost the case and then I think he kept trying to get into the media and tried to drag some other women into court, but I think they're kind of just not going for it at this point. I think everybody sort of realizes that he's litigious and dishonest and frankly, mentally ill. Yeah, yeah, definitely uh, comes across as uh, disturbed. But still, you know, it was it was a really awful process for these women and some of them, as I understand it, lost their businesses. Um, you know, it was obviously a really stressful thing for them to have to go to and be, you know, their names were in the media and the media was protecting his name, which I thought was really unfair. So I mean, can you imagine how bizarre that would be to like you move to Canada from wherever you were born and you start a business and then you lose your business because a someone wants you to wax their balls and you refuse to do it? Yeah, it's insanity. I mean, you'd be like, what is wrong with this country? You know, I thought this was like a progressive place. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I, I mean... His his identity was being protected by the media, although he was tweeting about the situation because he could, just couldn't help himself. So he was outing himself publicly on social media. In other words, there were like reviews on Yelp under his name and face saying like, so-and-so did a great job on my Brazilian bikini wax. Um, so a blogger discovered his identity and was like, this is who this guy is. And I tweeted and said, is it true that this person is Jonathan Yaniv? Like, and I shared a link to the blog post and it was confirmed to me. And I said, yeah, it's him. So, and then I was permanently banned for the rest of my life from Twitter for referring to this predatorial man as him. As I understand it, they've never actually told me what rule I broke. <laughs> they accused me of hateful conduct and banned me for life, but never actually really specifically told me what I did wrong ever. Well, so what impact did this have on your career? I mean, it does seem, and I, I hate to say this, but it's true. It does seem like in some ways you have disappeared from the conversation when you were one of, if not the most sort of prominent gender critical voice for years. Totally. I mean, like I can't, I can't be present in the conversation without sort of being on Twitter. And, you know, like I, I obviously still doing a lot of work on this issue and still talking about it and still interviewing people about it, but you sort of do get forgotten about if you're not Twitter on Twitter. Um, it's hard for me to share my work. It's hard for me to defend myself. I mean, the amount of the amount of libel that is out there about me is insane. It's impossible to even track, you know, the amount, the, the things that I see people saying about me online is just out of control and there's nothing I can do about it. I can't defend myself. I can't speak for myself. I can't share my work. I can't share my perspectives. I can't correct lies about me. Um, it's been, you know, it's hard for me to maintain an income without that platform. Like I'm, I am doing okay, but it's like you, people act like it's just, oh, so you got kicked off of Twitter. Who cares? But it's like, this is, this is my work. This is what I do for a living. Um, and if you can't get your work out there as an independent writer or journalist, media producer, you can't make an income and you can't build an audience. Um, and you know, I, 
I, I, I just, I think that people downplaying this really aren't understanding like the broader repercussions, not just for me, but in terms of things like free speech and access to information and things like that, wherein Twitter is dictating ideology and, and they're dictating what constitutes hate speech. And they're saying, you know, like anybody who questions gender identity ideology or doesn't want to use so-called correct pronouns is hateful and dangerous. And, you know, they're so bad that they can't even be allowed on Twitter, whereas like the Taliban's allowed on Twitter. But apparently I'm worse than the Taliban, you know. Like, <laughs> well, well, Megan, I mean, is the Taliban turfs? <laughs> At least they're not transphobic. Actually, right? maybe you know what that would be. That would be the way to get the Taliban off of Twitter is to uh, to get them to say something gender critical. <laughs> totally, <laughs> the only way to get the Taliban off Twitter. All right, Megan. Uh, thanks so much for coming on the show. Where can people find you? Uh, so I host the same drugs on YouTube. If you look up my YouTube channel under Megan Murphy, I'm on Instagram, Megan Emily Murphy. I have a public Facebook page. Uh, feministcurrent.com is my website. I have a podcast also called Feminist Current. The Feminist Current podcast and the Same Drugs podcast are both on all of your favorite podcast apps. Um, I also have a, a Patreon where people can support my work and I also have been doing, I post post some um, private content there, you know, I'll write posts there sometimes. And I also have started to do weekly live streams, like AMAs, like ask me anything there. So people can sort of engage with me privately and I'll share some personal inappropriate things on there. It sounds like sex work, Megan. You're selling yourself. You're selling your brand. <laughs> I haven't showed anybody my naked body on the Patreon as of yet. <laughs> Not yet. Maybe that's next week. All right. Awesome. Thanks so much. We will post links to all of this in the show notes. Great to talk to you. Thank you. All right. Yeah, that was a good chat. I, I didn't know uh, before I listened that she's in Mexico. It's just funny to imagine her like away from all this controversy and just like a touristy beach town or whatever it is. Yeah, just like enjoying her life while people in Vancouver like put up fucking stickers calling her a turf or whatever. I think one of the areas where like my opinion has gotten more ardent in the last few years is like there are a lot of people who think that just because she thinks trans women aren't women, that right away should she shouldn't be allowed to speak or use mainstream platforms. And I I just feel like, you know, it could be twenty years from now, we'll find it ridiculous anyone argued that, but people are trying to change the law and and argue that we should change our understanding of sex and gender and to just say that people aren't allowed to express opposition to to something else other people are proposing I, I think is just sort of insane and um it's not a good sign that that Twitter feels empowered to do what it did. It would be interesting if we could take a time machine and go back even like five years and be like, hey guys, in a few years you're not going to believe this, but in a few years. You can be banned from Twitter for saying that men are not women and for not believing that trans women are literal females. It's also the – the I've tried to stay away from the Jessica and Eve thing because it's such a fucking nightmare. And this is like a – I think a seriously unwell person. But the idea that – um how to phrase this. Jessica and Eve filed – a human rights complaint saying you, you and a female esthetician, you need to wax my balls. The idea that, I, that there's some like real moral imperative that we have to say, no, 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 that, that, that person's female. That person's a woman. It, it makes me mad in the same sense. I get mad when I hear about like really creepy dudes. I'm sorry. Maybe I'm just not enlightened enough, but that's like viscerally just, that's like disgusting to, to say that we have to treat that person as, I don't know, man. Well, you would also think that you would – if you're going to get your balls whacked, you would think that you would want someone with expertise in ball waxing. <laughs> Just wild guess. Wild guess. You'd want someone who's done it before. You would also maybe think you'd have some degree of shame that you're trying to impose yourself on someone who doesn't want to handle your genitalia. Just a thought. but yeah. Well, I guess those women aren't ball palmers. <laughs> ball palmers. She's trying a, to force them. That's yeah. a good word. <laughs> yeah. All right. So thanks once again to Megan uh, for coming on the show. We will put links to her podcast and her Patreon in the show notes. Going to be some messy links this week from from horny swords to Jessica and Eve. So enjoy wading through those. Yeah. There's also lots more in the Patreon version. So Megan and I talked about pornography, about sex work, about surrogacy. We had some points of disagreement. Um, and if you're interested in that, join us at patreon.com slash reported. Mm -hmm.
This has been Blocked and Reported. I'm Jesse Single, and remember, I'm not just any horny anthropomorphic battle axe. I'm your horny anthropomorphic battle axe. And I'm Katie Herzog. And also remember, if Juno Diaz kissed you or didn't kiss you, or you met him or didn't meet him, reach out.